Okay, so we're live, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us. I'm with um, the remarkable Pete Rowe. Pete Rowe has been with the San Diego Union Tribune for 35 years. He's a graduate of Berkeley. Um, during his 35-year career with the Union Tribune, he's interviewed everyone from gubernatorial candidates to the Dalai Lama, which I'd love to hear about. It must have been a treat for you to be with him. I think you interviewed him uh, two or three times, didn't you? Well, interview is maybe the wrong word. I was in the room with okay. the Dalai Lama three times where he, he is giving kind of a talk to journalists. And then he took a couple of questions. I think he took one of mine. But, but uh, you know, the, the highlight of that was he shook my hand. So that was great. Yeah. What was the question you asked him? Do you remember? No, I don't. Um, although I believe it had something to do with the, the administration. Um, because he came for UCSD, the graduation in 2018. That's right. And, uh, of course, there was quite a bit about, um, for one thing, the Dalai Lama's visit was a bit controversial because UCSD has quite a few Chinese students from mainland China who uh, are brought up to believe that the Dalai Lama is a, is a dangerous person. They believe he is a separatist who wants Tibet to be um, independent, separate from China. And they were very upset that he was coming. Um, but also, I mean, the Dalai Lama had quite a bit to say about immigration. Yeah, he, it's interesting. He's, we see him as a religious figure. The Chinese sees him as a political figure. That's correct. And I, I think the Chinese would probably argue that all religious figures are political. Interesting. They would see the Pope as a political figure. And there's and there's a lot of truth to that, right? You know, I, I covered religion for the last couple of years at the newspaper and um, and have my own faith, you know, heritage. Uh, and it's true that religious belief does tend to bleed over into political activism and political positions that people take. Certainly, we've seen that with the evangelicals and President Trump. Well, you know, it's interesting that you were the religious editor of the paper for a while, um, because that's one spirit. And then, then the other side of the spirit, um, you wrote the beer column. <laughs> a different kind of spirit. It's <laughs> true. Uh, well, all, all, of us, all of us are complex, multifaceted people. Uh, so yes, that, that's another part of my personality. I, I love beer. Uh, and when I turned 40, my brother-in-law gave me 40 beers and I just started writing up little, you know, little reviews of each of the beers and one thing led to another. And, and soon enough, I had a beer column going in the paper. Um, in addition to that, in your personal life, when I first met you, you had three remarkable sons when I first met you. And now, um, I don't know, 30 years later, you have three yeah. remarkable grandchildren. That's correct. Yeah. <laughs> You've, come a long... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You've come a long way, baby. We have. We have. We've seen a lot of different things. Um, what's it like being a grandfather? How are you enjoying that? How are you enjoying being a grandparent? Oh, being a grandfather is great. I mean, everyone should be a grandparent. I mean, being a parent has its ups and downs, uh, but being a grandparent is almost all up. You know, it's it's terrific. Uh, so if you could become a grandparent without being a parent, I would recommend it. That's, Just that's <laughs> yeah. so Jump right into that one. So, uh, <laughs> um, on a more serious note, um, this is an interesting time in our history, um, specifically for journalists. I mean, what a time. And in your 35-year history as a journalist, you know, I'm just I'm going to ask you a question that we probably know the answer to. Have you ever seen anything quite like this? And how would you assess the role of a journalist in this particular time when facts is optional? Uh, when reporters are treated as the enemy of the state and they're called that. Um, and certainly when you went to Berkeley and studied journalism, there was no class on um, journalism in the time of facts 
as option, right? <laughs> you didn't have a class that, that no. kind of taught you how to do that. And so, what is the role, what is the role of journalists today, and 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 how do, how does a journalist pivot from the traditions of journalism to to a time when there seems to be just this vast, unregulated um, terrain in terms of how journalists are done? There don't seem to be a north star that you can look at and do the work you do. Yeah, I was thinking about. Uh, this earlier today about the whole notion of fake news. And we certainly hear a lot about that today, uh, especially from from the White House. Uh, but, you know, I think all of us are looking for um, news that's reliable, that is accurate, you know, that we can turn to. And not only are we in this crazy period of political turmoil, and you keep hearing that, you know, the, the president doesn't go by any of the norms. Previous presidencies were in uncharted territory here. Uh, but we're also in the midst of this pandemic, which is unlike anything I've ever seen. And, I, you know, we, we lived through SARS. I was actually in Japan when uh, the SARS uh, outbreak occurred. And it shut down travel. I had planned to go to China that year, but I, I did not because of SARS. But really, that that was the only impact it had on my life. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I just traveled elsewhere in Japan, which was great. Uh, but this, this, of course, is affecting all of us uh, to a pretty dramatic extent. So I think all of us are looking for accurate information in order to live our lives. Um, so we, we judge accuracy in different ways. What seems accurate to you may not seem accurate to me. Where you go to get your news may not be where I go to get my news. Um, I think we're all looking for a couple of things. So one, we're, we're looking for um, information that's useful, right? Information that we can actually um, use in our life. We can use to kind of build our day around we're also looking to see if this source of information proves credible. So either it will prove credible in our own experience, or we will see maybe by errors, uh, you know, whether the errors are corrected or not. I mean, most of us, I think, are pretty good at spotting errors. Um, so when someone tells you that this is the largest inaugural crowd in history, and then you look at a photograph that shows the previous president's inaugural crowd, which looks much larger, you know, you're, you're able to judge, right? So we all judge, we all judge what's credible, what's not credible. We all have sources of information we go to. Um, again, yours might not be mine, but, but we, we find them useful, and that's why we come back to um, as a journalist, your job is to be as credible and useful to as many people as possible um, and not to um, trim your sails to, you know, to go in a, a certain political direction. Um, facts are not optional uh, in journalism. Facts are optional for some purveyors of news, uh, but but if if they're if they're approaching news that way, you know, where they're just shaping the news to their own their own pre preconceived notions, then they're not credible. And I think again, I think most of us are pretty good at judging credible and, and not. You know, one of the two words we used, um, I used to think they were synonymous and perhaps they're not, they're not any longer, and, or perhaps they never were. And we used the word news and we used the word journalism. No. Is, there, yep. is there a distinction between news and journalism? And what's the, I, what's the I would say so. Okay. I, I think now we have more sources of news than ever, right? Okay. And yet we have fewer journalists than ever. Uh, that's, that's the the difficult position that we find ourselves in right now is that we're inundated with news, you know, 
I, whenever I talk to like third grade classes, and so I'll talk to you like a third grade. Uh, you always have. I, I always do, right? Yeah. So <laughs> come with me now to third grade, uh, and and I I put N E W S on the on the chalkboard, and then I arrange the letters like a weather vane. So northeast, west, south. So news news comes from every direction. It's all around us. What's news to me might not be news to you. Maybe you've already heard this. Maybe it's something that doesn't interest you. Uh, but we all have different ways of looking at news. Right? I I get a lot of news, uh, you know, from this, right, from the, the cell phone, and some of it's not not accurate. Um, there's a lot of stuff being thrown at us that's um, rumor or conjecture or opinion. Uh, journalism, the way I see it, is is the accurate recording of the day's events that are presented to you, we hope, uh, in, a, in a way that's compelling, and that's literate, uh, and that helps you as a citizen. You know, it has a, has a very specific constitutional job to do, and that is to keep the citizen informed so that the citizen can make informed decisions, voting, uh, protesting, uh, petitioning government, you know, showing up at city hall, um, all of those things, uh, news is essential or journalism is essential in, in providing the, the raw material, the data that you can act on. <laughs> In its in its desire or in, in its um, in its in its need to pivot, and in its need to work with a contentious um, presidential office, where the journalists again are called the enemy of the people, where they have to then go back the next day and be still reporting accurately and factually on a president. Um, and within an administration that simply does not disrespect them and attempts to discredit them, is there permanent damage from that? Can journalism survive this kind of, you know, assault and still maintain its integrity? Or is there going to be some damage to journalism, uh, you know, from here on out? I, I think there has been damage to journalism, uh, but I, I think that this is an ongoing campaign. Um, this is not the first, this president is not the first political figure to point out that, you know, the press is terrible, the press is unfair, the press, you know, is biased, the press, all of, all the things that you don't want uh, your reliable news source to be. Um, I don't think we've ever seen quite the campaign, you know, I mean, in the past it was more kind of infrequent. Now it's a regular kind of part of his uh, his shtick. I wonder if perhaps that's wearing thin. And I, I, uh, I was a professional journalist for forty two years. So uh, was a journalist at two other papers before coming to San Diego. The first time in my career that I was approached by someone and thanked. This is not someone I was interviewing. I, I, I had a, a news media uh, placard around my neck. Uh, this actually was at the Dalai Lama speech uh, and I was trying to get from point A to point B and there's this guy in my way and he stopped me and thanked me for doing the job that I do. That had never happened, never, never, not once. And it wasn't the only time. That was the first time, but then it happened a couple of times after that. I think people are more aware of journalists and what they do. I think if you take a look at the coverage that was done of the protests, not just here in San Diego or La Mesa, but elsewhere around the country, um, journalists for the most part have been welcomed uh, as 
people who can tell the story and the story needs to be told. Uh, and so there's always, I think there's always a little bit of mistrust uh, between a subject and a journalist, especially if you don't know them, you don't know their reputation, you don't know their work. They come up to you, they introduce themselves, they ask if they can talk to you. You don't know what's going to happen. And it can go sideways. I mean, it has gone sideways, right? But I think I think in these in these protests, we've seen a lot of kind of welcoming of the journalists, just that they're present, that they're seeing, that they're recording, they're they're providing the first draft of history. What is the media getting right? I mean, you know, one of the things sometimes I look at the media and I become a bit frustrated in um, some of the choices it makes in respect to the news it gives me. And I'm thinking, what, what, where was that decision made? And was that the best story to inform me? For example, if um, the president makes an Atlantis statement, is right. there some, some, does that necessitate news slash journalism? You know, and is there some way that the media, and, and I'm asking this, I'm being very careful on how I'm asking that, is there a way that the media sometimes is complicit in its own misperception? Do you know what I mean by that? Yeah. Yeah. I think the answer is yes. <laughs> uh, at, and and I'll, I'm going to pivot from the national to the local sure. like you know, my coverage of national news is pretty scant. Uh, but um, early in this administration, every every unusual tweet coming from the White House became a story and a big story, right? And the the rationale was, well, it's the president. Mm-hmm. What the president does is important. And that's true. Right? What the president does is important. The president is arguably the most powerful person in the world, or at least holds the position that it's the most powerful position. There's a difference. But, but I think we've gone a little too far with that in that, you know, we have someone in the White House who makes outlandish statements like maybe a dozen times a day. Um, and I think it's been a challenge to the traditional media to kind of sort that out. Do we ignore it? Do we, do we only do the most outrageous ones? Do we only do the least outrageous? Do we only do the ones that actually are about policy or where the, the president says, I am doing X, as opposed to, you know, I believe that, you know, Obama bugged the White House. It's like, well, um, I will say, too, that we tend to, when we are media critics, which we all are, myself included, um, we tend to say the media, and often what we mean is television, and Uh often what we mean is cable news, right? So... Uh, if you go to CNN, probably right now, uh, there's a roundtable. <laughs> they're not they're not reporting any news. There are three people who are supposed to represent the left. There are yeah. three people who are supposed to represent the right, and they're going to yell at each other for an hour uh, about about one of those tweets, or maybe a couple of the tweets. And that's not news. It's and it's not really useful. In terms of, again, useful information that you can take as a citizen that's going to inform you when you make decisions, you know, about your community or about national elections, local elections, that's not really helpful. Go ahead, go ahead. Let me let you finish. But it it sells. Um, Yeah. It sells advertising. And And that's what I was... Go ahead, that's another thing that, that we can talk about is, is the economic pressures on the news industry currently, which are 
um, as severe as ever. There, there's never been a time where the news media has been under more pressure economically. So that the news is entertainment. The, new, the news is a commodity. It, it, it's there to inform, and at the same time, it's a product. It has, it's a product. Right. We have to sell it. We have to, we have to add a little salaciousness to it in order to make it tantalizing enough for the consumer to come back. And I wonder if that happens at an intellectual cost for the collective society, because a democracy is predicated on its citizenry's ability to critically think and critically engage. And yes. if the news is commoditized, um, that means I have to dress it up, I have to put a little lipstick on it, I have to get a little scandal going, I have to, <laughs> right? And, right? And that decision at the expense of something qualitative that would be important for the, for the collective society to know, right? Yeah, but I mean, there's a, it is a commodity, as you say, it is a business. And, and I, I personally am happy that it's a business because it provided me with a salary for over 40 years. You and selfish you man. You don't do that. You don't do that generally. Um, well, I mean, you, you know, as you came out of the nonprofit world, you know that it can be done in a nonprofit way, but we do have a nonprofit. We have a couple of nonprofit media organizations in town. One of them just laid off three staffers and then cut the pay of everyone else, and that was KPBS. Yes. Uh, so somehow, if we're going to make the distinction between news, which everyone gets and everyone spreads, you know, your, your kids, you know, are, are news reporters in that sense. You know, they come home from school, they tell you what happened. Um, and journalists who are paid professionals, um, you have to you have to come up with the money somehow. Yeah, yeah. You know, when when you think of the um, when you think of the news, for example, I think of KPBS, right? They mm-hmm. they do the news hours. Where news matters. Right. 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 Uh, how does that formula? I mean, they have a very small audience. It's um, you know they don't have the market share that a CNN or MSNBC or Fox News has, and yet they continue. If you want serious news, that's where you go. Right. I mean, at least for me at the local level, right, if I turn my television on and I really want serious news that at least I perceive to be impartial or at least fact based, I go to KPBS and I look at the news hour. Um, But then again, that's like a niche market. That's not right. That's not a mass produce kind of thing. And so some people will argue, in fact, had a conversation with a guy named Levi last night. And he was saying, well, the reason that stuff is on is because people demand it. That's what people want, because if people wanted serious news, CNN would be radically different, Fox News would be different, MSNBC would be different. And so the people don't demand it, so the news doesn't give it. Is that a fair assessment of the public? Well, I'm not sure, because, I mean, we're, we're being given what we're being given. And I, and I don't know. I mean, maybe there are focus groups that they're running in which they find out yet that, yeah, the, the American public doesn't want serious news anymore. They want some scandal, they want some titillation, uh, and then they want a feel-good story at the end, right? Um, I don't know. I, I, I know that wasn't how we approached the news at the newspaper when I was there, but um, there was a great deal of emphasis on, increasing emphasis on what is being clicked on, right? Mm. Um, we've been we've been online for maybe twenty years now, uh, and so they are very much looking at what do people go to, how long do they spend on the story, and and how many of these people are subscribers? How many non-subscribers read your story and then subscribe? That's 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 priceless. If, if you, <laughs> If you can keep doing that, you're in great shape. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I guess we have new tools to measure um, what's popular. And at times, there's a certain amount of eat your vegetables, right, that has to take place in the news business. There, there's a certain amount of material that's maybe not that much fun or salacious or 
scandalous that still is important for us to know. And, and you know, third, go ahead, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, I mean, we're, we're seeing that we're seeing that uh, in spades in both the uh, the ongoing protests that we're seeing across the country and also the pandemic. Neither of these are terribly fun stories. And, you know, I guess you could say that there's a certain amount of, of grisly uh, voyeurism that can be catered to with, you know, when you, you've got that video of the cop with his, that's right. his knee on, on George Floyd's neck. I mean, yeah. that's, that's horrifying. It's just horrifying. And it's, and it's, a it's a car wreck kind of video where you, you can't look away, but you hate yourself for watching yeah. and you hate what you're seeing. And, that's right. you know, um, but I was going to say, other other than that, and video like that, because we've seen more videos too. Um, these are not feel good stories. Yeah, but, but they're important stories. They're the most important stories today. Those yes. two stories are the most important stories today, and yet neither one is particularly suited for that that model right, of presenting the news. You know, it's interesting as you were speaking, one of the things, and I want us to talk up to this about local news, you know, and what, what you were doing for the 35 years with the New Tribune. But as you were speaking, you know, one of the things that um, in terms of the George Floyd story, it was a 17-year-old girl who just happened to have her cell phone and videotaped this whole darn thing, right? Yes. And yeah. here's, here you are, 17, you right. happen to phone, you put it out there, and this is what you capture. I mean, and right. it shifted the world. Within the realm of journalism, is there a place, because this 17-year-old girl, if she does not, my hope is she goes to Harvard and Yale and she does right. remarkable things in the world, but if that's the only thing she ever does in the world, she certainly has a book, a movie, I mean, there is something, there's no way this young 17-year-old girl is still the same. Should she be recognized by journalists, even though she's not a journalist? If a citizen captures something like that, should there be some recognition for her contribution to the field of journalism, even, even though yeah. she did nothing other than right place, right sure. time with, with this thing, but the contribution is, is eternal. I mean, this is going to, she's affected history. Is there a role yeah. for citizens in, in respect to their relationship with the journalistic environment? She is a journalist. Now, oh, she, may she, not been, she may not have been paid, but she reported the news, and she did so, I think, courageously. Um, you don't know what that cop is thinking as he looks at her, but he's looking at her. Yeah. She is, you know, she's not doing this surreptitiously. She's right there, and and she's taking a risk. You know, the Pulitzer Prize Committee, I think last year, maybe the year before, added uh, video, uh, video reporting um, as a category. Uh, and I would not be surprised if she is at least a finalist for a Pulitzer Prize. Uh, because, like I say, these, these are the two biggest stories right now. And that is in the, in the racial, you know, you know, the story about discrimination, policing, where we're putting our money in, in our society. Um, that's, that is the central bit of reporting is that video. And you're right. It, it is important globally. I mean, it, it made news around the world. It caused people to mobilize around the world. It's leading to change around the world. That's, you know, that's, that's far beyond the impact that most of us can dream of. What was it like reporting in San Diego for 35 years? What did you learn about the city politically, socially? What were some of your favorite stories that you've done? We'll talk about the beer stuff later. But, because, uh, uh, you know, but what, what did you learn about our city in the 35 years? What did you see and what unfolded and blah, 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 blah. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> well, I, I grew up uh, in North County. And so I was coming back when I came back. Um, in 1984, and I was 29 at the time, so 
Uh, so most of my adult life uh, has been here. Um, San Diego is, um, <laughs> I think, is a difficult city to kind of understand, in part because it seems so relaxed and so casual, mm -hmm. and to a certain extent it truly is. Uh, but there are real lines, um, there are real ethnic, uh, social lines uh, that a lot of folks don't cross. Um, one of the great experiences for me as a journalist, and one of the things that I think was also important to me as a, as a person, right, just a, on a human level, was going to the Catfish Club. Um, mm. As George Walker Smith said, there was no place like it in San Diego that people from all walks of life and importantly from all, all ethnic groups would cross paths there. And it was true. Um, and it was, it was relaxed um, and it was casual. You know, it had kind of a San Diego feel to it that way, but it was unique uh, in the way it cut across racial, ethnic and, uh, and economic lines. Um, I don't think there's anything like it that's taken its place, and that's that's a real loss. Uh, but as a journalist, you saw a lot of, you know, being raised in Encinitas, certainly you saw San Diego evolve over time, right? And being a journalist, you saw it up close and personal because you were putting a lot of microphone, but you were certainly interviewing people across all sorts of discipline, whether it was a professor or a politician or whoever it may be, um, right. in respect to the evolution of the city and how the city was at some point going to evolve to what it is today. Um, do you remember any particular story that, that, that was, you know, stuck out in your mind and you thought, boy, this is certainly a, a change, this is certainly a turning point in the city. Was there anything that you covered that you thought, boy, this is the beginning of change in the city and then we'll go back from that? Well, not the beginning of change, but um, covering the, the Dalai Lama's appearance at UCSD really brought home to me how important UCSD is as an institution, um, that it brings together, uh, again, I mean, you know, it brings together kind of like a, a, a larger, more academic catfish club. It brings together people of all different backgrounds, not just backgrounds, but nationalities, and so you know, it was fascinating to see how the Chinese students were reacting to this. I interviewed a couple before. Many of them didn't want to talk. They were afraid that they would be in trouble back in China or that their families would be somehow uh, disadvantaged if, if they said the wrong thing. Uh, but, but there are a fair number, you know, of Chinese students there. And there are a fair number of students from Japan and there are a fair number of students from Korea and there are a fair number uh, from Europe, but mostly it seems the, the uh, foreign body, foreign student body is from Asia. And that, that's important too, I think. Um, increasingly, you know, my, my own view of San Diego is shaped by kind of Pacific Rim issues um, and the trade that we have that goes uh, to, to Asia and the trade that we have that goes south uh, to Mexico is so, so important. I think really, you know, over the years, my thinking about San Diego has changed about, I used to think we were a tiny city, well, not a tiny city, but a modest sized city in this cul-de-sac, right? Pacific on one side, deserts on the other, the border to the south, Camp Pendleton to the north, but really, the border, the border isn't really much of a border. I mean, it's it's an artificial barrier that's, that's pierced all the time, um, and both in, in business but also in culture. Uh, certainly, we saw that with food, but I mean, I'm thinking more in terms of film and music, and art, and visual arts. Um, there's you can't overestimate the impact of Mexico on, on San Diego, or Baja California specifically. But we're also seeing that with Asia. So I, I, 
I think my thinking about San Diego is kind of, you know, expanding that it's not really a city. It's, it's this kind of way station. You know, people pass through from primarily from south of the border and from, from to the west of us, you know, across the Pacific. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Um, is that a negative? Do you see that as a negative or a positive? Or uh, if you had to evaluate that, what's the, what are the pros and cons of that? I think most of them are pros. Um, I think San Diego, because of this, uh, has become a much more interesting place than when I was a child. When I was a child, it did seem a lot more insular. Mm. Now, we're I'm not saying that we're all cosmopolitan, you know, and uh, welcoming all this. We're not. Um, many of us are not. Uh, but it's. I think it's a positive thing in that we, our culture has been enriched. Um, we, we are exposed to different ideas, different ways of doing things. It's, I think, revealing that the current administration really has an anti-Mexico stance, that the current mayor of San Diego, who's of the same party as the president, uh, has opposed i mean not strongly but i mean if you listen to him you look at what he does uh, it's clear he's not on the same page when it comes to the larger issues of immigration and that i think republicans in san diego and, and much more so democrats in san diego and independents are trying to make immigration work yeah. and trying to to use this to our advantage. What, what is the, what has been the evolution of the Union Tribune? You were there for 35 years. I think you yeah. were there as the Union Tribune, the San Diego Union Tribune, and it had a, what was it? The evening paper and the morning paper. Right. So it, what was it called? It was the Tribune and- San Diego Union and the Evening Tribune. And the Even Tribune, and there was a time back in the day where it had a relationship with the Los Angeles. Your sister, your sister publication was the Los Angeles Times, right? That's that's a recent development. Okay, can you talk about what's happening with the publication and why a local newspaper is, is important for a city that's this of, of this size? Sure, sure. Let me just say in general, I think that newspapers are important to communities around the country. Uh, because they tend to be the largest news organizations in a region. And a lot of what you see, a lot of what you hear on television or radio is kind of rewritten newspaper stories. Uh, and a lot of news directors at television stations are taking their cues from what they see in the newspaper that morning because there are more journalists at the newspaper than there are at any individual television station or radio station. So there's, it's just, it's just a, a factor of sheer numbers, right? I, I would argue it's also that the newspaper tends to do a better job, but, but that's, a, that's a whole different argument. Right? But we certainly have the numbers. So, but if we go back to when I was a child and arrived North County, the union uh, had a terrible reputation, and it was a mouthpiece for conservative Republican interests, and it was very much in the bag for uh, Richard Nixon, um, Pete Wilson, uh, you name it. I mean, any, any Republican, any conservative Republican got the union's backing and endorsement not just on the editorial page, but also in the news pages. The news was slanted to, uh, to their advantage. I remember as a kid reading uh, news stories from the Union uh, about protests against the Vietnam War, and it was presented as protesters who were backing the commies or the Reds. I mean, and those were, those were words that were used in by the, the reporter in the news story. So they made no 
pretense of being objective or just giving you the facts. They were, they were telling you that this was wrong. Um, when I arrived in 1984, it was somewhat different, somewhat better. Uh, Helen Copley uh, inherited the newspaper from her husband, Jim, who was a conservative Navy veteran. Uh, she was also rather conservative, uh, but uh, she wanted, she was friends with Catherine Graham of the Washington Post, and she wanted to have a respectable newspaper. So some of the sacred cows were no longer protected. Many of them still were when I got there. There were certain things that just weren't done. The Copleys, well, David Copley inherited the paper from his mother. David Copley sold the paper to Platinum Equity in 2000. And I forget because it was such a, it, it, it is like, like how you forget extreme trauma. I forgot, <laughs> I forgot what the year was. It was horrific. Uh, Platinum came in and <laughs> so, so the Copleys, the Copleys, uh, Jim Copley, Helen Copley, David Copley had successively kind of loosened the restrictions on reporters to the point where in 2006, the paper won a Pulitzer Prize for exposing the corruption of a conservative Republican congressman, Duke Cunningham. And that was under Helen. So and things were a little bit looser still um, when she died and uh, David Copley inherited the paper. Because he really wasn't that interested, I think. I really think that was bad. So he sold the paper because he was losing money. Um, and he sold it to Platinum. And Platinum knew what to do with a, a money-losing newspaper. And that was a bloodbath. He just laid off. <laughs> hundreds, of people, literally hundreds of people. It was horrific. And then, then after a few years, they sold the paper to Doug Manchester. Now that was better in terms of uh, job security. Interesting. And and it was worse in terms of the newsroom culture. Newsroom was. Morale, morale was the lowest I, I saw in 35 years. Oh my goodness. Um, because they had a specific agenda. They wanted the news to, to play to that agenda. Uh, when they didn't get stories they liked, then they put editorials on the front page. Uh, they, they ran the infamous editorial about how Obama was the worst president in the history of the United States. I, I know that they were backers of the current president, uh, but they, they sold the paper before that election. But it was, uh, it was I think, a, a real misunderstanding of the newspaper and its influence and what a newspaper can do in the 21st century. Maybe, maybe this is what happened in the 19th century or for parts of the 20th century, but the newspaper could no longer tell the powers that be what to do. And the newspaper under Manchester tried to tell City Hall, you know, to, I mean, one of the big, big things that they wanted was a, uh, an entertainment district with a football stadium down on the bay where Manchester is developing, currently is developing a rather large you know, it's a huge office building with condos and shops and so on. So he wanted, he wanted to have around that, this entertainment district, that would be anchored by the Chargers. And, and no, one, no one followed his lead. And I think that this was a, a shock that, that because he had this megaphone in the newspaper and was running front page editorials, that that wasn't enough, that that didn't. That didn't really move the needle, and we still lost the Chargers. The, the other huge mistake they made that cost a lot of money 
and damaged the newspaper's credibility was they started up a television station, UTTV, uh, and they started the television station without, with I think they had two or three hours of programming a day, and that was it. Um, and they <laughs> and they they found a spot or they bought a spot on cable to you know, kind of host this channel, uh, and then they hired a bunch of folks of varying degrees of professionalism. Some were quite good, but most were not. Most were embarrassing and they were not journalists and yet they were spreading the news. So again, there was that distinction between news and journalists. You saw it every day on UTTV and it did a great deal of damage to the Union Tribune brand. They also of course changed the name of the paper, which I think is a bad move to um, UT San Diego. Yeah. All right, so then, so then some years back, um, the Tribune Media Company uh, bought the Union, the Union Tribune, and, and restored the name, San Diego Union Tribune. They also bought the Los Angeles Times. And then after a couple of years, a couple of difficult years with Tribune, um, they sold uh, to, to Patrick Sunshong, the current owner. So they sold the Union Tribune and the Los Angeles Times. Clearly, the Times was the larger part of that sale. It was the most important piece. Dr. Patrick lives in Los Angeles. He's part owner of the Lakers. He has a medical supply or medical um, equipment company in Los Angeles. Um, he's quite, you know, he's, he's not a Los Angeles native, but he, he's, he's the next best thing. He's really established in LA. The Union Tribune is kind of the stepchild. Um, and in some ways that's good in that we're kind of overlooked and the great experiments that are going on are going on in LA. And Jeff Light uh, the publisher of the Union Tribune is kind of allowed to, to a certain degree, to call his own shots down here. Nice. <laughs> but, but for the first time in decades, if not more than a century, we have a rather progressive publisher. Uh, we have a more centrist editorial page. Uh, the problem is, is that all of this is happening. I mean, I'm speaking... <laughs> I'm speaking now from my own bias, right? Uh, but the problem is that all this is happening at a time when um, revenue is down and staff is is overwhelmed. I mean, there just is not the size staff that you really need to be doing all the things that the Union Tribune is trying to do. So you need people to subscribe. You need, you need local people to subscribe. And, but you need advertisers. Yes. Well, when I started in the business, the rule of thumb was the newspaper got only 25% or maybe less of its revenue from subscribers, and the rest came from advertisers. Uh, the recession of 2008-2009 changed that model, and increasingly we're, we're putting the burden on you. You know, we want you, the subscriber, to be covering more of our, of our expenses. The thing that's happening today though, is we're in this difficult position where you, you see technologically that the future of news is going to be digital. Yep. Right. And so your, your digital subscribers are still a fraction of your subscribers to the physical newspaper, um, and your digital ad rates are still tiny, right? I, I saw a study from uh, the Pew Research Center that said now across the country that the average newspaper, newspaper company, gets 35% of its revenue from online sources. That's a big jump. Uh, it was, I think, 18 only in 2012. So, 
So it's really climbed up uh, quite a bit. It needs to climb up even more. It needs, yeah. we need, we're paid news, newspaper subscription or circulation is plummeting. It's dropping by about 10% a year. Um, this is across the country. The Union Tribune's done a better job um, of kind of holding steady. It's more or less plateaued, right? But it's it's not where it needs to be. And the the solution, Jeff Light believes, the solution is in turning more and more to digital subscriptions and digital ad sales. So we'll see if if that can. You know, if, if that future can arrive in time to save the newspaper. Interesting. We're almost out of time. I've got okay. like three more questions for you. One is speaking of newspaper and the future of newspaper, what did Jeff Bezos do well at the Post? The Post, he came in, he was a tech guy, he was a multi gazillionaire when he got there. He really didn't need it. People right. wondered what his intention was. Um, was he looking for a broad mouthpiece, a, a, a broad megaphone? Is he going to control this thing? Right. And what has he done right in, you know, just a few words or so? And did he, and has he positioned the post as a model for other publications to follow? Well, yes, yeah, he did a number of things right. One of the things he did right was he hired more staff, right? So the post is well staffed. Um, they also uh, made a point of uh, increasing the newsroom's diversity. We haven't talked much about that, but that's a big issue. And it's one that newspapers in particular have not done a very good job on. Very small. Diversity, diversity meaning the, the ethnic makeup of the staff, of the journalists. Well, not ethnic, but also gender. So, uh, Got it. Getting, and I think, I think the Union Tribune uh, is at least, I think, at least 50% female. Right. Interesting. Um, we're, we're nowhere close to, you know, reflecting... Um, the ethnic makeup of the county, uh, which is important, you know, because like I say news comes from everywhere, right? And if you are a general publication, you want to be covering all all of the communities. Harry, what what Bezos did right was he hired more people? He hired smart people. He hired from different communities. Um, he also, I think, if you read the Post. Even if you read the news stories, you detect a slant. It's it's pugnacious. It is coming after this administration. It's not holding any, yeah, holding anything back, right? Um, I think the New York Times uh, has a more uh, conservative tone, right? Conservative meaning not politically, yeah. but just they're not as uh, out they're there. A bit more measured. More measured. Great. You should be a journalist. <laughs> um, the other thing, but the other thing the Post does, and, and I subscribe to the Post digitally um, because they have flooded the zone. I mean, they, they cover Washington as they should, but I mean, they cover this administration like no one else. Uh, the New York Times does a, a very good job of covering the administration, but the New York Times has more of a global you know, outlook. Uh, so for foreign news, I tend to go more to the New York Times than the Washington Post. Um, the, the model doesn't particularly work for the Omaha World Statesman or the Chicago Tribune or the Seattle Post Intelligence or the San Francisco Chronicle or the Union Tribune um, because these are national newspapers they appeal to a national audience. Same is true with the Wall Street Journal. They have more of a, you know, they got the business audience. Um, and we, we try to do a lot of that as well, but there's no way we're ever gonna cover Washington as well as the Washington Post or the New York Times. We just don't have the, the resources. On the other hand, there's no way they're going to cover La Mesa as well as as the Union Tribune. And by the way, while we're talking about the local media landscape, 
uh, television, the local TV stations did a terrific job of covering the protests and then the, the riot that followed in La Mesa, uh, whereas KPBS did not because they don't have the staff. They don't yeah. staff the news on the weekend. It's a huge, huge gap there. And again, it comes back to money. You know, how do you afford having the staff to cover the news? You know, um, one of the things you did in your 35 years with the Union Tribune was something that must have been, you know, just, I would think, painful for you. And I don't know how you were able to sustain sustain that measure of pain. You're, you're um, talking about the beer bean. I'm talking about the beer column that you did. I mean, that right, must have right. been daunting. I mean, there must have been times when you looked at your wife, Lynn, and said, Lynn, I don't know if I can do this another day. I'm drinking beer. I'm getting paid for it. I'm eating right. amazing young men in the craft beer industry. I mean, but I'm going to take it for the team. I'm going to do this because I'm a giver, Lynn. I'm going to do this for the community. I care um, about it. You're a giver. You're a giver. Hey, I'm How a giver. Are you- <laughs> all right, all right, knock, knock that off. But I let me let me in, in semi seriousness defend defend the beat and tell you, you know that beer in San Diego County is is twice as large as the Padres, just in terms of revenue, uh, in terms of economic impact. It is is something like three times you know, has three times the impact of every institution in Balboa Park, including wow. the zoo, right? Wow. So it's it's a huge, huge industry, has become a huge industry, and I was privileged to watch it kind of develop. Uh, <laughs> and while reporting, of course, you know, you could take it on faith that this was good beer, but it was best to be sure, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, right. <laughs> Go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Well, so there, there were over over the years, and I covered beer for twenty five years. Over the years, uh, I had editors who thought it was totally a joke, you know, covering beer, and there were others who recognized that at times, at times, there are serious beer stories to be done. So it, it was a blend. It was a blend of, you know, like a, like a fine sour ale. You know, it, it blended some of the, the serious stuff and some of the lighter fruity stuff. Um, and it was, it was terrific fun. <laughs> <laughs> really? I'm confessing. <laughs> I'm confessing. No one, no one could tell, but I was having a good time. <laughs> well, um, I had the pleasure of having a few beer dinners with you, and I was always impressed, uh, on a more serious note, I was always impressed with the caliber of young men and women in the craft beer industry that were brilliant, passionate, held themselves to a very high standard, um, was learned, um, were supportive of each other. It was a community that shared I believe there was a period of time when there was a hops shortage and they were sharing hops with each other. They were lending each other equipment. I mean, it was one of those um, communities of, you know, of of entrepreneurs and kind of innovators that were really holding themselves to quite a high high standard. And, um, uh, you know, is that still true today? I mean, how would you, how was the, how was the um, how was the how was how was the industry evolved? Because I remember you and I went and we did a beer tasting downtown. One of the early when I met you, we were downtown. We were drinking some beautiful beers, and of course, it was hard work. I mean, it, this wasn't yeah. we sure. weren't having fun. I mean, this is right. you know this is Dang like this is like the scientists at Salt doing research on something, right? I mean, that's uh, we were we weren't in white coats, but. You know, we thought we were. <laughs> we, felt, we felt like we were. And, um, and um, but this beer, my, this craft beer went out of business because there was a saturation. There was this market saturation. Can you talk about where the industry is today and saturation and, you know. Right, right. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, that's that, of course, is one of the serious stories to be done right now is is, is the market saturation or oversaturation. And then at the same time, you're being hit by the coronavirus. That's right. Which means that roughly for a lot of these breweries, maybe half of their business was gone because half of their business was sending kegs or not sending, but selling kegs to restaurants and bars. And so when the restaurants and bars were all closed down, you know, they, they lost half of their business like overnight. Um, so what you noticed uh, early on is still mostly true, that camaraderie, that willingness to help each other, the, you know, rising tide, lifting all boats. Um, but there have been some exceptions and the large brewing companies, the large corporations, you know, Miller Coors, Anheuser-Busch, uh, they have come in uh, and purchased um, a couple of breweries here and pumped money into them. That's caused a lot of hard feelings in the industry. Uh, right now, Stone is involved in a rather large lawsuit with Miller Coors, and Miller Coors owns St. Archer, which is you know just up in, in Miramar. So yeah. you can imagine there's you know there's not that great sense of camaraderie when Stone meets up with yeah. the St. Archer. Uh, you've got Ten Barrel uh, downtown, Ten Barrel's Anheuser Busch. Um, people were really upset when they came in and, and right away opened up this beautiful and large um, brew pub uh, in this in this neighborhood that already had a number of right. small small kind of craft brew pubs. Uh, so. So there's more competition. Uh, there's more competition just at the craft level, and then you've got the, the corporations coming in and adding to that as well. Um, I think, though, that that in San Diego and in most of the United States, that craft has such a, a firm toehold that it's kind of too late, you know, yeah. for for the big uh, big beer to come in and buy everybody up. Um, and we saw we saw how that could backfire with uh, Ballast Point, yeah. which was purchased by Constellation Brands, which is the company that has the rights to distribute um, Corona in in the United States. So a, a huge company, and they paid a billion dollars, billion one with a B, for uh, for Ballast Point, and sales uh, rose and then they fell. And they did not recover. And so last year, uh, they sold Ballast Point to a, a tiny brewery out of Illinois. Uh, so once again, Ballast Point is a craft brewery. Um, that doesn't mean they'll succeed or that they'll turn things around. But, but it does mean that they've been welcomed back into the fold you know, by, by the other craft brewers. Interesting. Uh, you know, um, because of you, I have had the pleasure of meeting quite a few of the brewmasters. I've had the pleasure of going to several beer dinners with you, both here and in Japan. We had a nice beer dinner in Japan um, on a few occasions, and that was quite lovely. And so um, there is something about, like you said, I think there's a generation of men and women who were raised on craft beer, mm -hmm. and there's no turning back. I think there'll always be a market for it. And uh, I think for the culture of San Diego, the craft beer industry brings so much texture to the culture because it's always this discovery, right? You can go from craft bre craft beers, a microbrewery, craft brewery, whatever it may be, from, right. from brewery to brewery, and there's right. this constant discovery about the innovation that's happening there, right? And I don't think that's going to go away. I think that's yeah. here. Yeah. And one of the things I enjoy about craft beer, you mentioned discovery, and it's not that every craft beer is great. And right. That, that, that you have to love every craft beer. Right. You right. Love anything, right? I mean, come as you are, take, <laughs> taste what you taste, enjoy what you enjoy, and, and leave behind the stuff you don't enjoy. That's right. That's and there's right. such a broad range of beers. Yeah. There's yeah. sweet beers, there's sour beers, there are very... Um, well, we've had a number of dark beers. They're dark beers. They're very 
very light beers. They're very yeah. um, aggressively hopped beers. They're very subtly hopped. Um, I mean, they're all across the board. Yeah. And so find the beer that works for you or yeah. the beer that works for you and, and knock yourself out. You know, have a good time. I could talk to you forever, but what I'm going to do after this, I'm going to get in my car and come to your house and have a beer with you, whether you want me to. I know. Oh, so I know. The one will have, yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, I'm, 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 I'm 19 years old. I've graduated high school. I'm going to be going to Berkeley. And I heard about Pete Rowe, and I called you and said, Mr. Rowe, I'm going to study journalism. What do you say to me? I, I say good. Uh, I'm, I'm really happy to hear that smart people are going into the, the business. Actually, you know, I mentioned that the staff at the Union Tribune now is overwhelmed. You know, they've got too much to do and not enough, not enough bodies. But uh, the people there are the smartest and most dedicated and most talented people that, that I've seen in my career. So it's great to see that. Uh, one, you'll have to uh, be very um, flexible and you'll have to master a lot of different skills. Uh, increasingly, it's no longer enough to uh, report a story and, you know, and type up a great, you know, type up a great story and file it. Uh, increasingly, you have to market yourself through social media you have to, um, I mean, if I was going to the business today, I would also be looking at how to uh, use my cell phone to, um, to video, uh, to make a, a video story to go with the print story, right? And edit that and, uh, and provide the, uh, the voiceover for it. Um, we're doing podcasts, we're doing, um, I mean, at, at the Los Angeles Times, and again, I mean, they're they're kind of on the forefront of a lot of this. At the LA Times, uh, they've done a number of podcasts, which then they've sold to Hollywood. Uh, there was the Dear John series, which turned into a TV series. First, first it was a newspaper series, written right. Then it was a podcast. You know, where the and, and we talked to the folks who did that. And he said, there's a whole different set of skills that you need. Um, so uh, so <laughs> then they do the podcast, Dear John. They, they have to kind of like completely rethink the story and how they're going to present it. And then Hollywood picks it up and turns it into a multi-part. Uh, Unbelievable. Multi-part series. So I would just say, you know, be, be flexible, be open to uh, anything, absorb all that stuff. Berkeley's a great place, a lot happening. Uh, but, you know, see if you can develop different skills. Another skill that I think is super important, Jeff Light's always saying super this, super that. So super important, uh, not just your English language skills, but a second language. Uh, Spanish, of course, is great here. Um, if I had my career to do over again, I might uh, might look into you know seriously pursuing Japanese because uh, I enjoyed reporting from Japan so much. Yeah. Um, lastly, last question. Um, congratulations on your retirement. Congratulations you. on you, the, being a grandfather. Um, thank you for 32 years of brilliant writing and your contribution to this city through your writing, through the heavy, heavy, demanding beer tasting that you've done for us. I mean, that's our biggest thank you more than sure. anything. Done. That's, I mean. I, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm working right now, right? right. <laughs> working, it's nonstop. Been... It's nonstop work. Yeah. <laughs> the Dalai Lama would be proud. <laughs> <laughs> Um, last thing, and we, we have to go. But, um, I've enjoyed knowing you. Thank you for our, an astonishing friendship of conversation and dinners and cigars and beers and everything else you've offered and the wisdom you've shared with me over the years. What would 25-year-old Pete say to Pete right now? What would your 25-year-old self say to you right now? I'd, I'd tell myself to relax uh, that... No, 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 no. You're not, you're not speaking to your 25-year-old self. Your 25-year-old self is looking at you 
Yeah. And I'm going to say something to you. Is that what you were saying? 25 year old self is going to say something to you. I'm going to say, what, what the heck happened? I, <laughs> <laughs> I don't recognize you. <laughs> um, I love it. <laughs> uh, it would say, I. I don't know. I mean, 25, I think I was still living in, uh, in Virginia. Yeah. Um, so I, I would be shocked to see myself in San Diego again. Yeah. Uh, but also pretty happy about that. Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you for everything you've given to us. And, oh, uh, sure. Well, um, listen, thank you for having me. It's been a great pleasure just to talk with you in this forum. Of course, it's a great pleasure to have you as a friend and talk to you off camera we'll we'll have the real conversation later 10 minutes before we leave ladies and gentlemen um this is possible because of amanda canilia um amanda is the owner of bella vista cafe she is talented she's smart she's bright she's daring she's unafraid and bella vista social club cafe will and shall return she's working on it as we speak um, she's speak also let, if I can interrupt, she's also remarkably well connected. She just she has, a has an incredible, incredible list of contacts, and I, I'm, I'm kind of one of them. But you know, I, I think I'm three <laughs> steps removed. You know, Kevin Bacon out there, but, um, but here we are. Yeah, <laughs> there you are. There you are. It's only because you've worked so hard to give us so much. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, Amanda, we, we appreciate you. We love you. We recognize the work you do. And um, Bella V Cafe, um, Bella V Social Club Cafe, this, this podcast, the podcast, this broadcast will be live on the cafe and then edited in about a week or two. And then we'll be on B E L L A V TV, B E L L A TV, and we'll see the edited version of this. Um, Pete, thank you so much. Absolutely adore you. Thank you for the time. It's been a great pleasure. Thanks for having me.